leaving around 10 p.m. in the middle of the night and going up to this this summit of the mountain. I think we made it up. It was it was on some uh, snowy glacier, it was still quite soft snow. And I remember getting to the summit and we couldn't really see a whole lot because it was foggy, and then headed on down. And I couldn't. I remember not being able to see very well the descent, and and I may not have had uh, my map and compass available. I was just trying trying to descend the same way we had come come. No, we, we were trying to go off another side. That's right. We were going to go up and over down the other side. But I do recall at one point in my confusion with the terrain on this glacier in a fog bank, encountering a set of tracks. I'm like, wow. I can't believe it. There are other tracks up here. This is unbelievable. We just found that some other people have been up there. And then within a few moments, it dawned on me that I had found our own tracks and that I was indeed off route. So today we get Outdoors Nation, I have the privilege of um, welcoming Vince Anderson to the podcast. Uh, Vince is a incredible mountaineer, coach, guide, educator of mountaineering guides and coaches, and owner of Skyward Mountaineering, based in, I think it's Denver, Colorado, and he'll correct me if I've got it wrong in a second. Um, but beyond that, he's just a flipping awesome dude. So um, we're going to have a great chat tonight about all things mountaineering. Vince, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, we are in Colorado. We're over in Grand Junction, not not in Denver, but in the same state, but on the other side of it. Oh, I got yeah, I got halfway there, which, considering I'm around the other side of the world, is pretty close. That's all right, close enough. <laughs> so, Vince, uh, our paths um, first crossed, or I first became aware of you when you uh, made a comment about a YouTube video that I did around um, generally being devil's advocate around qualifications in the outdoors and saying you shouldn't get those you should go do something different and it, and it seemed to spark a a thing inside of you and, and i wondered if we could start there as, as a conversation around what did that video spark inside of you and what were your views yeah that's that's a it, it, yeah it did for sure I was um, interested in your podcast and did some searching and found found you on the YouTube. And that was the first one that I watched. And I thought it was quite interesting uh, subject matter for sure. I'm involved in teaching guides qualifications uh, through the American Mountain Guides Association. And we are a member of the International Federation of Mountain Guide Associations, the IFMGA. And so as one who's invested in helping people uh, attain skills for the craft and the credentials that go along with it, I certainly have uh, some affinity towards that concept. And I felt like a lot of what you presented was very accurate, actually. I, and I, I actually do think there's there's quite a bit of merit to the idea that you presented regarding if you look at attaining a career in the outdoor world, outdoor industry, loosely under the umbrella, I guess we call of of guiding or leading people around in this in this outdoor environment, uh, it's it's a it's a difficult balancing act between you you have this value you, you of being outdoors and all the things that the, how that enriches the job more than. Um, you know, other types of jobs are not not as nice as that. With with the uh, often the, the compromises you make and typically in financial rewards from that. And so, I think anybody would agree that the, the whole reason people are hiring someone to guide them or lead them in the outdoors is their expertise and their ability to. Um, provide a meaningful and safe experience uh, with respect to the various things going on, given the activity you're doing. And that will be benefited from some familiarity that's often gained through a training process. However, from the person that, that's providing that, from their perspective, to gain that that expertise, if you will, and training, that often comes at the expense of, of a, quite a bit of money and time invested in, in going through those. Uh, types of programs and certifications. So I can see where the, 
the challenge is how, how do I justify investing resources into into something that I may not reap the rewards as as well from um, when I'm finished. Mm-hmm. You gave a couple of good examples of I think kind of extreme ones of walking around a lake or something like that. I think was one example, like taking some people on hikes or very uh, lower risk activities outside. Mm -hmm. And then another example was guiding Mount Everest and being kind of a different extreme there. And how maybe somewhere in between there is where more people end up at. And, And simply by the numbers involved of how many people and how frequently you could take these walks around the lake, uh, you, you may be better off um, doing that than, than the amount of work. And, and certainly with the risk management involved on the Mount Everest type of thing. And, and then therein lies the question of whether you invest in the training or not. Mm-hmm. I think that's kind of what I heard. And I thought it was interesting. And I, I'm my perspective, at least what I do is is a very narrow band of what we call outdoor recreation, and that's technical mountain climbing. And so, you know, it might be closer to the Mount Everest side of the example, though I, I don't personally go there. Um, but uh, to give an example of uh, just on, um, let's see here, on Tuesday, I was out in an area called the Black Canyon National Park here in Colorado, where we have large granite walls with so rock climbing. And uh, for that type of experience, I really find the training that I went through to be beneficial for me to not only provide the uh, the quality of experience to the to the person, helping them achieve the the climbing goal that they wanted to, and provide them with a comfortable day out, not just not just getting the rope up, and then also the, the ability to attend to the various risks and hazards associated. I benefited a lot. In the training for that, but that, that's somewhat of a, a narrower subspecialty within the, the larger group of outdoor guiding and that sort of thing. Mm. It's interesting. One of the things that I find with um, guiding qualifications and full full disclosure, um, I, in the kayaking and canoeing world, I kind of did exactly what you do in the mountaineering world. So in terms of training mm-hmm. guides and leaders, so it's it's not that I'm against people getting qualifications. One of my largest frustrations was people wanting to do jobs that they may well get themselves just about qualified for, but really are not experienced enough to go and do that do that work that they set themselves up to go do. You know, they, they haven't spent enough time at altitude themselves, or they haven't spent enough time in third world, in my case, third world advanced white water. Um, and... I became very aware when I set up my first business some 18, 18 years ago, well, that's a while ago, that um, I could find qualified people. But what I really needed wasn't necessarily qualified people. I needed people who could do what I deemed to be the other 16 hours of the day. You know, when, when you do something, you're very often only active for eight hours of the day. And then there's looking after clients in camp. There's being able to cook a meal on two MSRs <laughs> for, for 10 people. Um, there's the somebody has an unusual epileptic fit at three o'clock in the morning and you're in a very remote place, then what? Do you know what I mean? Um, and it's almost impossible to cover all of those eventualities in a training program because it's kind of experience that teaches you how to do that stuff. Um, so what is it? In Skyward, what are you looking for if you bring on a contractor or a freelance member of staff or a new employee? What What's your process for vetting they'll hold our standards up high enough for me? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I yeah, you, you bring up a really good point, and I feel that I see that quite a bit through, uh, well, particularly with my role as an instructor for guides. And uh, and I'll get to what we look for here in our own business in a moment. That, but I do see there's a lot of folks that I think I don't know. Maybe they read in some magazine article about the ten greatest jobs in the world, and one of them's a mountain guide. And people are like, "Wow, I'd like to be a mountain guide." And they learn what's involved to become one, 
And that's a little different path than I took. And it's not necessarily a worse one. I was a climber, dirt bag. All I wanted to do was climb, climb mountains and climb rock and backcountry ski when I was a very young man. And guiding was a way to essentially support that passion of mine. And so I had the experience just because that's that's what I lived 365 days a year was that lifestyle. And I see more now some of the type of individual you described that have, has sought out the education with the minimum, the bare minimum of the experienced part of the equation. And sometimes they do lack, like you said, these peripheral skills or just having that depth of, of experiential base to draw from in unusual situations or anything off the you know, kind of run of the mill type of day. Um, and so certainly when that applies to, to, to our business here, we use the, the training and qualifications as a starting point, uh, if you will, or maybe it's an end point, uh, but also in addition to personal experience within the field, uh, it's just doing the activity. Like I want to see somebody who's essentially a black belt, if you will, at whatever it may be. If we're going right, if it's a rock climbing guide, uh, I want to have somebody that's a pretty darn good rock climber and they've been trained as a mountain guide, not, not, or, Mm -hmm. and I think we are getting a lot of ors now. Um, there's a lot of people that are very good at what they do. It it, be it skiing in, in my world, the mountain world, skiing, climbing mountains and climbing rock and climbing ice that don't want to or don't 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 uh pursue guiding and there's also a lot of mountain guides that teach ice climbing take people rock climbing take people mountaineering that often don't have that personal experience based themselves but you know i interestingly enough i've just been working with a few other guides and and I was in Alaska this spring. It's a it's a popular place to climb in North America for Mount Alpine climbing. And Denali is by far the most uh, frequented mountain for folks that are hiring mountain guides. So there's a lot of guides that are employed up there. And it's very common now that the guides first time up Denali or even something remotely like it is as a guide. Mm. And sure, they often do it and, and they're under the some mentorship level, but they're really learning about the mount, the mountain and the big mountain and the expedition as a guide and not from having done these expeditions on their own. So I, there is a change. And, and I think the point you bring up is a good one that, I, that a lot of people are looking at the curriculum in whatever the, the industry is through the credential that you can gain as all they need to, to get these jobs that, that seem desirable. Mm. It's funny, when, when I read, used to run um, guide training programs or, or coach training programs, that the people who got the least out of it always and often struggled to it pass or didn't pass the assessment part of it were always the people who were struggling to keep up in the environment. They weren't technically able enough, tactically able enough, physically fit or strong enough. Their decision-making wasn't particularly great. And so they couldn't absorb the how-to-guide information that we were giving them in any great detail because they're kind of catching their breath the entire time and surviving themselves. Um, and, And that that didn't necessarily always make it pleasurable as a program for me to deliver because you kind of feel like you've got half the people there who are up for learning and the other half who need a bit of quite a lot of babysitting. Um, But equally, it's like a false economy as well. If you're that person who's at the lowest end of the group when you go to do your training program and you're struggling to keep up in the environment, you've probably wasted a bunch of money on that program because you may well have to redo it again and pay to do it again. So I wonder whether that, however many thousands of dollars, may well be better spent booking a flight to the Him- uh, Himalaya or to the Andes or to Alaska and going and getting some super quality mountain days under their belt. Yeah, you're right. That's 
I, we, I experienced that exact phenomenon where we often have the, uh, the individual that, you know, may on paper meet the minimum requirements to enroll in these courses. And though, like you said, they're, they're, they're at their limit to say climb, they're, they're, they're maxing out when they're on the climb. And then the, the, what happens with those folks is most of their mental faculties are involved in self-preservation and, and, and in order to climb the difficult for them uh, climbs and very little, they don't have enough bandwidth beyond that to think about these, you know, the needs of the clients or how, how the, the systems they employ will, will, will benefit or, or take a, or be, be a disadvantage to, to the clients. So that, that happens. And, and I used to tell folks, I think a, a common phenomenon here in the American West is this ideal, this idea of van life. Have you ever heard of van life? Yeah. <laughs> you know what that is? I do. Indeed. If so, I've yeah, got a friend who's on the van life thing at this point in time. Okay. So that's a big thing here. A lot of, a lot of guides are, are what I call van life, hashtag van life. You get your sprinter van and, and you, you kind of vagabond, uh, live, uh, this bohemian lifestyle, which, which is quite desirable. I mean, it, I'm, I'm a family guy, so that, that ship has sailed for me. But when I was younger, van life, or, or for me, it was probably like Subaru hatchback life, <laughs> but that, that sort of thing, that, that, that's a real thing. And, and you want to roam around the West and, and guide here, or guide there, then go to the next location and do that. And, and so it, it's so common that I've, I've told a lot of people that are trying to get through our Alpine program. I made up a slogan: "Sell your sell your van and go to Pakistan," because a lot of times that's what they they spend a lot of time hanging out in the van and going to the the whatever local backcountry ski resort or ski areas or crags, but not not a lot of actual expedition mountaineering that would have benefited and doing more uh, involved committing climbs on their own. And so when we get into a, a course or exam and we ask them to guide one, it's sometimes they're, they're the most committing and involved climbs they've ever been on in their life, mm. which in the context of a, of a course or an exam, it shouldn't be that those, these things should be within your comfort realm so that you can have opportunities to take it in and, ed, and be educated. That's it. That's it. I, um, I remember the phenomenon. I did a, a kayaking expedition, whitewater kayaking expedition in um, Central Africa, um, crikey, 20 something years ago. And um, I, I remember that the sudden thought going through my head is that if, if, if shit goes wrong here, it doesn't matter how loud I scream or, or, or what I want to happen. There isn't a helicopter coming. There isn't a rescue party coming. There is nothing. It's you, you, and you. And uh, that really ups your game in terms of risk management, in terms of your decision making, in terms of you know, uh, in terms of absolutely everything, um, and and how you can still have a good time without being so boringly conservative that you go backpacking. In my case, with a kayak on my back, you know, you just hike the river as opposed to kayak it. Um, and I think you're right. Sell the van, go to Pakistan. In Pakistan, if, if shit goes wrong, you can hope on occasions you're going to have some help, but it's probably just hope, eh? That's right. Yeah, I think, um, it, it, that, well, yeah, going to Pakistan or a place like that nowadays, they're becoming rarer and rarer, true, truly remote type of experiences. I, I, uh, I started guiding in, in Alaska and uh, particularly in a remote area. And, and that was, I didn't know any different. And it's in, in the 1990s, uh, we didn't have the capability to communicate as easily as we do now. Mm. And, and it definitely changed. It, it really informed how I viewed uh, moving through the environment, a foreign environment like that. And because you really have to rely on your own abilities to. To, to do it to succeed as well as if, if something happens to be able to, uh, uh, you, you know, you have to be completely self-sufficient if, if something happens. And now you, you certainly still do, but the information and, and connection with the outside world is, is there. And it's really changed the paradigm quite a bit for modern 
outdoors. And I think for the better, I mean, it's largely a safer world to get out into as a result of that. I mean, the risks and hazards are still there, but you have, I think, more ability to gather information regarding them um, mm-hmm. via your your contact with with others that you can have quite a bit more easily. Do you think things like the spot device, you know, the, the orange spot device, uh, do you think that caused any... Oh. Yeah, he's got one behind him somewhere. Ta-da! Right there. Oh, those bad yeah. news. They're, they're the, oh, those, those things. I love those things. Um, but do you think they've caused any complacency in enthusiasts in the outdoors where they take a risk knowing that they can hit the old crap button and hopefully somebody will come? I think they do. I saw this phenomenon that you're describing for the first time for me when I started uh, climbing and guiding in the Alps. And though there, you know, it's 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 a cell phone call away from a general, you know, if the weather's good, a helicopter could come pick you off most places. And I saw people maybe making subtle uh, comments regarding that if, if it wasn't that great, they could probably call for a rescue if they needed to. I actually also, I, I, I've noticed this too in Yosemite. I climbed in Yosemite a bit in the 90s. And there, there as you can imagine, if you're up on El Cap, you, you can get help pretty mm. re- readily. You just yell and someone down there in the meadow will hear you. And, and I, you know, you'd hear about the occasional person that called for a rescue. They weren't sure. They were kind of wet. They didn't want to find out the bad way that they they really needed one. So because you could call for a rescue, sometimes occasionally people would that would have been in. Maybe they were not in as much danger in, in the end as they perceived. But the ability that that knowledge that you can do it, I think, changes the equation and will likely impact some individuals to, to take on more risk. I think we see that with a lot of things. Avalanche, you know, in backcountry skiing with the avalanche rescue equipment, uh, the advances in that, I, I'm certain that's contributed to some individuals being more willing to expose themselves to higher level risk. Certainly, these communication devices do now. And interesting, you, you know, I, I had a opportunity. I, I climbed Nanga Parbat in 2005. And while we were there, um, that same year, it, for those that are familiar at all with the history of that mountain, Reinhold Messner had climbed it in 1970 with his with his brother Gunter, and it was a very famous climb. And, and unfortunately, Gunter did not uh, make it on the way down. They went down this other side, and there was quite a bit of controversy surrounding um, this this accident that happened to Gunter Messner in 2005. They found some uh, remains of of Gunter that uh, essentially validated Reinhold's story that his brother had indeed probably died in an avalanche over there. And so Reinhold was over there visiting the mountain, leading a, essentially a trek, and uh, had a somewhat of a small entourage of people along with him and some media from, uh, you know, probably the uh, Italian and you know German speaking uh, part of Europe with him. And they they visited us and it was great. We we, we had some coffee or tea, if I recall, with with Reinhold. It was a real wonderful opportunity. And he was asking my partner and myself about our climb and how we were going to go about it and everything else. And we had told them what we were doing. And he told us that he really appreciated that we were following what he called the ABCs of mountaineering. And I'm like, well, what are the what are the ABCs? Like I I've I've not learned what what are they? And he said, A, you have no artificial oxygen. And I was like, okay, okay, yeah, like we're not we're, that was our plan. We weren't going to use bottled oxygen. And B, you're not using bolts. Like yeah, we're we're not using bolts. I'm not I'm not against bolts, but we're we're not taking bolts up here on Nanga Parbat. And C, you don't have communication. I was like, ah. 
huh, well, yeah, we don't have communication, but it was more because we didn't have that option. Mm. <laughs> I think nowadays, I don't think I, I, I may follow the A and the B, but I, I'm, I'm taking this with me nowadays. But back then, um, at least I was on Reinhold's good list at that point in time, but we just didn't have any communication availability. Uh, there, there was another gentleman climbing there, Tomas Humar, who, who actually was rescued uh, and he had the C, he had a radio and he got into some trouble and was able to communicate and, and was rescued as a result of it. So uh, it did save his life likely. So it, it's, that's a hard call. Uh, and, and I know it does for some, maybe for Reinhold, there's this philosophical aspect to it that it changes. Um, and, and, and that's fine. I, I do feel though, when I'm working as a guide, I have a different set of standards that I operate under and, and it would be irresponsible of me to take clients somewhere that I'm responsible for without, if I have the ability to communicate, uh, to not, to not do, to not at least have that option available. Yeah, I agree. You've got that duty of care, haven't you? Where you need to go and do everything reasonable to ensure their safety, even if stuff goes upside down. I was just giggling to myself when you mentioned about that. I was in, in 1997, I was in the Himalayas in Nepal. And I remember having to book a phone call back to, back to the UK. Um, you had to like book it nine hours in advance or for the following day. And, uh, huh. you know, if, if you, yes, if you, uh, yeah, if you needed help, the fastest way for me, and I was kayaking, the fastest yeah. way to help was to go and finish off your kayaking because that's, you know, that, that's where a road met oh. the river again. And that's where the most likely form of help will be. That could be, Eight days away on some rivers, um, six days away. It's a it's a long way away. Um, it's a. I guess the world's changed, um, but I I do think I had a mentor back in the day, Vince, and uh, he was an ex Royal Marine, um, had been in the been involved with the special services here in the UK, and um, he he said to me, you know, the the more safety gear you carry, the more likely you are to need it. And I was like, I didn't quite get it at the time, but I kind of get it in some ways now. And there's that fine balance between carrying enough and not carrying so much stuff that you're weighed down, slow, not agile, so on and so forth. Um, what's your approach to, to getting people to manage their safety gear? Um, do, do, they, do you get people to have a standard list? or risk, risk assess every venture and then choose appropriate stuff to manage the risk? Or what's, what, what's your best advice for that? Well, I, I guess it would be probably more on the latter. I think that every adventure will necessitate a different level of preparation with respect to the, the at least the equipment that you may bring along. Um, you know, if I'm going to, you know, you can imagine with the proximity to some of the telephoriques out of Chamonix, those alpine climbs, you, you could have much less. And, uh, yes, you would probably have some assistance nearby from some party or some guides or, or rescue personnel. So I wouldn't be bringing a lot of elaborate things, but obviously to get more remote. I need to be able to provide the care that I'm capable of. And, and need to have those capabilities. And so what, what sorts of things does that mean? It, it changes. And, and I, for example, my, my first aid kit that I have, I have like components of it and more or less of it will go into my kit depending on the outing that we're taking. And then of course, you know, there's, there's the other factors with respect to the environment that you potentially are going to be in. Is it a cold one? And there's, there's all those protections and and you're right the balancing act is tricky if you want to get something done that's difficult uh you know the, all these things start to add up to weight how much weight can one carry along with them but there, there's definitely some basics that i have and again the, the standard i hold for my own personal outings where my partner and i are equally competent and and and, and both uh willing to, to the same look to the risks we encounter is different than when I I'm being paid to make all those decisions on behalf of a less competent party as a guide. And then 
that, that standard's quite different. But I, but I notice it too with the mountain guides. The, 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 the pack size is all is a big question. How big? You know, how do you guide with such a small pack? You know, when you bring this, that, the other in in the winter, the ma- avalanche uh, uh, survival equipment, th- those packs start to become quite big for what you would consider day outings, mm-hmm. and and it's a struggle to to try to keep things to a minimum. That and and, it, and I guess ultimately I look at like what's what's the likely things that that could happen here, and you know, like what are the main things that I I can do for that in this environment? And I don't want to be out there without something that was kind of obvious, but I don't want to be bringing stuff along that we, we really don't need. And then recently with COVID that we could operate is, is, is a godsend, Mm. but that involved even bringing more things to be potentially uh, cognizant of of not passing that along to somebody. If you had to provide care to them. Yeah. Jeepers. The whole new level of sanitizer and face masks. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. There's like so. You know, the one interesting thing of these, if, if you have to provide a rescue breathing for somebody, you know, the old method is mouth to mouth resuscitation. And then, if you want to be a little more careful, they have these little one way pocket valves that would go into the mouth of the victim, typically, so they yeah. they're, they can't. It exhale things into you, but that doesn't do anything for COVID. So now. There's these big old inflatable bag things that you can use that there's no mouth to mouth, which is much safer. But I think it weighs about a kilo. So that's just one more kilo you're throwing into your uh, backpack. Yeah, and it's not exactly a small um, uh, fits in the corner of your backpack no. item either. It's quite no, they're, the they're, they're, they're pretty good sized. Yeah. <laughs> I would say the world's gone bonkers, but um, I think it might have gone bonkers a long time ago. So, um, yes. Tell me, do, do you still remember that first day where you guided for the first time? You know, that paying group of clients. Um, does it still stick in your head? Yes, it does. Yes, yeah. I, I, uh, yeah, I can remember really well. Yeah, it was interesting. The first mountaineering trip I guided. I was, it, it was something that today I would not, I wouldn't send a new guide on. Um, I was in Alaska and I was f- flown by a small plane into a relatively unknown area that had to, to a couple of mountains that had glaciers on them and had uh, uh, no known ascents. They probably had been climbed, but we had no information regarding when, where they went. Or anything, but I had some information from my boss on a probable way to go up. It was, they weren't technically difficult, but it was it was in the summer in Alaska where it doesn't get dark, and and the weather wasn't great. It was foggy, mm-hmm. and so as a result, it didn't. So with the long days that you have up there, it doesn't really get dark. The the freezing can sometimes be a problem of the snow and so uh we we were able to we were able to uh climb at night and well well daytime but it was night hours as a result the uh leaving around 10 p.m in the middle of the night and going up to this this summit of the mountain i think we made it up it was it was on some uh snowy glacier still quite soft snow and I remember getting to the summit and we couldn't really see a whole lot because it's foggy and then headed on down. And I couldn't, I remember not being able to see very well the descent and, and I may not have had uh, my map and compass available. I was just trying, trying to descend the same way we had come. come. No, we were trying to go off another side. That's right. We were going to go up and over down the other side. But I do recall at one point, in my confusion with the terrain on this glacier in a fog bank, encountering a set of tracks. I'm like, wow, I can't believe it. There are other tracks up here. This is unbelievable. We just found that some other people have been up there. And then within a few moments, it dawned on me that I had found our own tracks and that I was indeed off route 
and and disoriented. And I was I was embarrassed uh, to recall that. So we followed our tracks back up to the summit, and then I think I did get out my map and compass and take us down the proper way. So I managed to get lost. That's what <laughs> happens. Good job. Really, you bailed it all out. Yeah. Yeah, you summited twice that that, that night. If we did, we got two summits. <laughs> <laughs> I often think, you know, as a guide, it's, it's, it's not about the mistakes that you make. It's about how you bail yourself out of them afterwards, how you, like, backfill that hole and keep a smile on your face and keep everybody going forwards. So that's almost, you know, for a lot of guides, it's, um, it's not if you make a mistake, it's probably going to be when. And um, it's how you get out of that mistake, I think, is the, is the secret to success. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> I've, I, sorry, I'm sat here giggling because I've got catastrophes running through my head or near misses that you had to go and deal with. But um, so after that first trip of yours, what was it that about guiding that got under your skin that you thought, do you know what, I, I, I want to do more than this, and maybe it's something that's more than just paying for me to go mountaineering. I, I know I'm not sure. I, it uh, it came at a point in my life when I was a young man. I had attended university and was learning to have a more traditional career. However, I was very passionate about being in the outdoors, particularly climbing and skiing. And it was really my first opportunity to guide came as a result of being at the right place at the right time. And uh, I had basically quit a job that out, out after university that didn't, didn't pan out very well for me and took some time off, went to Alaska and came upon an internship opportunity for a mountain guide service and just thought it would be a fun way to pass the time for the summer. I guess you could say I was soul searching, as many people do in life. At some point, they're questioning. You have a question of what do you really want to do with it? I hadn't found that yet. And uh, once I did that and I, 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 I connected with it, yes, I, I got the party off track on that first trip, but I got us back on track and I enjoyed providing them with that experience. I felt comfortable. I really enjoyed the, uh, well, the setting and being at being where I was at. And as I did more of that, it, it was very appealing to me and it allowed me to, to do more of what I wanted to do. And, and I thoroughly enjoyed what I was doing while I was taking people on, on these mountain adventures. Uh, interestingly enough, the, the company I worked for also at that time was very, uh, encouraging of the staff to to acquire additional training and uh, gave us some uh basically some uh they gave us a stipend to 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 do some additional training which was great so that helped me start on my own uh pr proper uh, formal training um through the mountain guide association and once i became involved with that i, I think between learning more of the skill and craft involved and appreciating it. I had an affinity for learning those, those skills and then gaining, uh, I guess almost like membership into a community of, of, of like-minded individuals that was very attractive to me at that time. That, uh, that really clicked and resonated with me and helped me decide to continue doing that. And I hadn't had that similar connection with some of the community and the, the or more traditional fields I had been in for, for whatever reason. And, and, and so I think that combination of, of those things really collaborated into allowing me to, to do what I did. And, and as, as a result, I continued to climb personally quite a bit and became good enough at it where I was uh, gaining uh, partners that were better than I, I was learning more that they were able to, to teach me. And, and, and I eventually was fortunate enough to go on some significant, very, uh, mind opening 
expeditions and climbs of my own. And then, of course, that feeds into the help with that, that provided better framework for me to become a better mountain guide. I was a well, much better climber than, than the sorts of things I was taking people on these adventures with. So I think one fed into the other. Mm. The, the, the climbing that I was doing fed into the guiding career, which allowed me this lifestyle to continue doing more climbs. And, and, the more, and, and some of the climbs that I did uh, were of note. And, and certainly that didn't hurt at all with my reputation in the industry to, to gain more clientele and uh, their comfort level with, with hiring me as a mountain guide. Mm-hmm. I think the, those combination of, of the personal experience alongside with uh, the professional guiding experience, they, they seem to really help me out uh, in, in all, all aspects in, in that career. Mm. But you mentioned just then some uh, mind-opening or even mind-bending uh, trips and expeditions that you went on. What, what were a couple of those that jump out to you and say, remember me? Yeah, I've done several at different levels and different inflection points, I feel. Like I had several. I think I climbed Denali on my own before I was a mountain guide. That That very summer where I started the internship and it was within my abilities but i didn't know it was and that to me and it showed me that i'm capable of you know i i made some mistakes there probably with respect to how we were um treating some of the crevasse hazard but we learned we learned uh but but i think just the ability to to be high at high altitude and climb things be in shape to move quickly that was that was really mind opening for me like yes this is something i can do i can go in this cold high environment and feel comfortable and make good decisions that one was one in particular that's not really a climb of note but at that point in my life it, it certainly was mm. and i think also well certainly my my first trip to pakistan was as mind exploding as I could have had. We that was when we went and climbed Nanga Parbat and um that experience left an indelible mark on me for for sure and beyond just having gotten a bucket list thing. It really wasn't even a bucket list. It was just a really cool thing that I'd be psyched to go try. And we tried and succeeded and and it pushed me in ways and brought out things within me that I, I wasn't aware of. And, uh, you know, I'll, I was a changed man afterwards, after that experience for certain. And I, I can see where you have an experience like that. It can lead to some level of complacency or you, you feel almost cocky about things. And I was very cautious not to, not to, to try to not let it do that uh, and, and still treat my, my future adventures with the appropriate do respect that they deserve. You said you were a changed man. What was what was the noticeable changes for you and for your family and friends when you got back to the US? Yeah, it's it's an interesting thing. I think partially as a result of the physical exertion combined with the just sublime beauty of the place I was at there would be similar to I could kind of think of two experiences that that I could relate them to. In other words, it, it's hard for me to describe why in words they were, but it would be, I guess, what people think of like when they've had some form of religious experience. Or uh, do you do you have children? I do. Yeah, two kids. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And and so you know when you have your friends that don't have kids and you're trying to explain to them what it's like to have kids and why and they, they just don't get it. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of, and I, I tell my friends that, that don't have kids like this. I'm like, Hey, um, have you ever tried to explain to your friends what it's like to take mushrooms who have never taken magic mushrooms and they just, they don't understand at all. Well, that's what it's like trying me trying to explain to you what it's like having kids. And, 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 and so th- there is a, it, it's just, it's truly, uh, I think, 
anybody can have that type of experience outdoors. But I guess what it left for me is a sense of connection and uh, that it's all about the moment while you have it. And all I have now is this memory of that moment or those moments that led up to that experience. Mm. And I, I have nothing more than that. These memories, which essentially memories are up here. They're not real. They're, they're, that's hard. I don't even know how to describe what they are. And it made me realize that you have to be in the moment and enjoy it for what it is while you have it. Because at some point, we have no more moments and the memories we have go away. Mm. So I think it led me to have a more profound, just, uh, I guess, experiential way to look at my life. Like, I'm not going to just be in the moment all the time and not, not take care of my responsibilities by all means, or I won't continue to have good moments, <laughs> but, but I do try to not take things for granted. And I realize how temporary uh, they are. And so perhaps that's what I took away from that experience in particular. And, and it was probably a combination of all these things that, that it, it was quite difficult for me, uh, technically, physically, emotionally. And, and, uh, and then you, you combine that with being in a, in a very unique and beautiful place. Uh, it, it was, a uh, it was, it was pretty amazing. Yeah. I, um, I remember my first Alpine trip and my very first, um, trip to the Himalayas. They, they, they shook me to my core. Um, not, not necessarily in a bad way, just in a, in a, a way. And you're right. It is like trying to explain to somebody who doesn't have kids what having kids is like, because you just can't. Um, you can't talk about, you can't describe that love that your kid has for you that is beyond anything else and unquestionable. You just can't put words to it. But um, as I've read more about psychology and studied more about psychology, something came to me that it's almost like before you had that experience, no matter how young you were, you had a fixed model of the world. You thought you knew what the world was about. And then often you go somewhere like a, a Pakistan or a Nepal or wherever it may well be. And their, their model of the world is like the polar opposite of yours, how happy they are with so little. We're whining that we don't have this and this, and they're delighted with 10% of it. Um, and it almost takes your other your original model of the world and turns it into something soft and squishy that you start questioning about what's what, what's really going on here and what's this globe really like and who really am I? Um it's a yeah, but there's no words that you could put to it other than a little bit of an explanation, maybe. It's funny. Yeah, I agree with you 100% about that. Yeah, particularly that with respect to, you know, pe people enjoy or not enjoy their life irrespective of uh, what they have, where mm. they are. You're, you're going to find, uh, and I'm sure 20,000 years ago, people lived pretty primitively and they didn't know any different. And some, some, and despite the depravities that they endured, still had some quality of life that would, I'm sure is comparable to, to what, I, what I have mm. in, in their own way. It was interesting. One of the things that triggered me into pursuing guiding was, was that knowledge that if I could get other people to go and have um, their version of, it, of an extreme experience for a prolonged period of time, be it two weeks or three weeks, um, it wouldn't necessarily have to be the highest peak in the world or the hardest white water or the, the whatever. It's just going to take them fully out of their comfort zone into something else um, and, and do it for a prolonged period of time. And, and the benefits that I felt from that, they could feel as well and um, probably be better human beings because of it. Uh, and for me, that was one of my primary motives of guiding was how bloody cool is this? And if I can give this gift to other people, what a gift to give. No, you, 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 uh, I mean, you couldn't have said better. That's exactly how I feel. It's exactly, I, I feel the, the same way as that. But what I've gained, I want to share with other people. And I know how to do what I do. I don't know how to kayak or perhaps I would do that. But what I know how to do, I try to share with people with the hopes that they can come away from this with some portion of, of what I gain out of this. 
And yeah, I, I, and my personal method is to try to push them outside their comfort zone. And everybody's a little different with how far or how you do that. Um, push them a little bit out there and get them to the other side and then bring them back. And, and it changes them in hopefully uh, positive ways, uh, both for themselves. And, and I like to think the more that people get out there and do these things, that we, we can have a better place. I mean, I understand not everybody has the opportunity to get out and, and do these fantastic activities, that at least what I consider to be fantastic activities. But that, that's exactly why I, I like to do what I do. It's, it's sharing these, these experiences with, with other people um, and, and trying to help them in their own way gain that. And it could be, you know, we, we just had some folks come out to visit from Nebraska, which isn't a really a, a, from an outdoors perspective in the United States. It doesn't have the most abundant opportunities. And they had done nothing. They weren't in physically the greatest shape. And I think just to climb the easiest rock climbs where we took them was a huge challenge. But it was in a beautiful canyon with just nice scenery and limestone walls. And I think they had a fantastic time climbing what would be regarded as very pedestrian rock climbs. But for them, I think that opened up a, opened up something for them. And I, I like to think that, that it had a really positive impact on them. Mm-hmm. Hey. Who knows how it changes their life? Maybe just they just take their health and fitness more seriously going forwards. Well, that's a win, isn't it? Eat, eat better. Um, that's a yeah. A, a, any little gain is 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 the way forwards. Um, it, it's interesting. Everything you talk about when it comes to guiding, it, it sounds like the the secret sauce is actually the people skills that's involved with it. It's about that recognize as you just said recognizing that. One person you can stretch this far, but another person you don't take them that far because they'll just have a catastrophe. So you have to like back off with that other person. And and um, how do people go and I don't I, I don't think people are necessarily born with that. So so how do guides go and get better at that if that is the secret source? Oh, I'm not certain I know the best answer to that, and I think. Everybody's a little different too in how they recognize that. I don't know that I serve every client as well as they could be. There's plenty of people out there that would be better served by a different person than me. I recognize certain things in some people, and I think other people recognize different things in them. And I feel the best that you can do in that regard is to try and have a lot of experiences with different types of people, particularly people that aren't like you. And I think that's one of the things that's, you know, living at least in the United States right now, there's a lot of, you're either on this side, or you're on that side and you kind of group in your group and you, you have your ideas and you believe in this is your way. And I don't know that's a real, I don't think that's a, great way to go about it. And, and that's a whole different story. But I do feel that being around different people different than you is one way to help your own understanding of, of humans. And, and as a guide, certainly be able to see in others what may be helpful or maybe they're seeking. It's real easy. To, if there's somebody that's like you, well, yeah, well, then they'll want what you want. And you, you just treat them the way you would be treated. I think that's a big mistake we all make. Mm. And, uh, you know, one of the things I have to say about mountain guiding that I'm, I'm somewhat embarrassed of is I just saw this statistic with gender. And I, I want to say in the international um, qualifications, of the, the internationally certified guides, there's, I think there's roughly 7,000 mm. globally, uh, of which there's some... Less than 200, but more than 150 here in the United States. That's one and a half, one, less than 2% are female. So that's, that's embarrassing to me. Um, that statistic in the United States, it's, it's higher. I think we're 10, 10 to 12%. Um, but that's still quite low. And, and that, that's somewhat of a reflection, perhaps, of those that are participating in these. But I can't imagine one and a half percent is, nor is 10%. And I would like that to change. And I think the more that we can change, uh, that there are like I'm I'm a I'm a white 
a straight uh, married male. So I see things in a way that a lot of other people on this planet do not. And I'm, I'm trying to become more aware of that, cognizant of that. And that has helped me, I think. And uh, I, or, But my industry is largely similar personalities. And, and I think one of the best ways that people can help their, their personal skills is to be confronted with some diversity in, in any form, really. It could be another person like you that just looks at things differently, or it could be somebody that's quite different from you. Um, but th- th- those things, I think, really help with, with, with the, the personal skills is, is being around a lot of people and different people. What do you think has to change um, to balance the books a bit? A bit maybe. Um, I, I interviewed a um, black African black guy who was a, a through hiker um, the other day, and he spoke about wanting to go hiking, recognizing it was the thing he wanted to do, and then going to the hiking store and um, to get his like first boots and backpack, and he left. He left the area of the city, and I can't remember which city it is now, that where he was brought up, and he had to go to the white middle-class neighborhood. And he's like, everything was safe, everything was fine, everybody was nice, yet I still felt out of place. Um, do you think that feeling out of place is, is the barrier that stops maybe more females um, going all the way through to be an international mountain guide or more people of color or or whatever else do you reckon that's the reason or or what do you reckon we need to change and adapt as an industry i I think that's part of the reason um when you have people i think with respect to i guess ethnicity and race it's often a result of in in these 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 sports that we're talking about in particular tend to be in more affluent regions of the world where they're popular. They're not necessarily, I mean, Nepal is not a more affluent region, but the average Nepali is not going on climbing expeditions. It's generally foreigners doing that. And so that's definitely a result of, I think, the, the makeup of those that have and those that have not, unfortunately. Now, not all these sports require an inordinate amount of money to do. Like today, you can go rock climbing. I think it's much more accessible sport. But part of the question, certainly with respect to gender, though, that's different. And you you could argue that you know the risks involved in some of these. Uh, women have a, in my opinion, a more well developed sense of self preservation than a typical young male does, and rightly so. They may avoid unnecessary exposure to risks that some younger males. Uh, would would gladly do and, and get involved in some of these sports, but not all the sport is that as risk taking as it once were. And yes, you go to the the climb rock climbing zones now, and you you see quite a bit of male and female. But to get into the guiding industry, I think there is that component of there's not as many of like if I were one of them, if I were in some way a non-white male in in, in any one of those. You don't see people like you doing it, and that may be less familiar and comfortable to do. And I think it, it is harder if, if you're not seeing them. And so I think part of what might need to happen to have change is to have a concerted effort to provide more opportunities for those people to be able to just get involved in these activities to begin with. And then within the leadership roles of, of uh, providing, uh, you know, instructors, guides, et cetera, more opportunities for them uh, as there are more of them to, to, to have to choose from. I know just at the uh, guiding where, where we are, we have opportunities for, for specifically for females we have less enrollment in the programs. It's not like we're turning around, uh, you know, we're saying, sorry. Uh, so, so I think there, there's a little, there, there's opportunity. I, it's going to have to come from, I think, a variety of things. Like again, providing opportunities for people that are not currently involved in them to, to have them. Mm. And that, that's not impossible. I mean, that, that's pretty easy to do. 
uh, there's, and then also encouraging them that are there to, to try to, if you're interested in this, maybe you want to consider doing what I'm doing here. And there's try to bring in more encouragement of, of those that are interested to, to pursue these roles as leaders. And I think once you see that more, it's normal. I mean, through social media, you can scroll through, pick, pick your sport. You scroll through your social media feed. You're going to see a lot of pictures of people doing whatever it is you like to do. And the more you saw people that somewhat relate to you, who you are, or who you identify as, you may be more interested to want to do that. Or you could see yourself doing it as well. Hmm. Do you think that there's also maybe a, um, a missing part I often wonder whether we have to like sink the hook of passion for climbing. It doesn't really matter which bit of the outdoor recreation world it is at a much, much younger age where I, I look at my daughter and she's five years old and she doesn't really see gender. She doesn't really see race. She doesn't really see any of those things. She just has a a great time doing whatever it is that somebody puts in front of her. And if they're, if, if they're a funny, inspirational human being, she wants to go do more of it. And if they're a boring instructor person, she wants to generally do less of it. I mean, that's just a yeah. generalization. So do you think part of the, of the source is sinking the hook much, much younger? Yes, I think that's great. I, I, what you that is true about children. I love that in that they just see people. Mm. Uh, they don't see the other parts of what that we see as you become mature. We gain these biases, unfortunately, but children tend not to. And I, yeah, seeking the hook and getting them motivated to do these things earlier is one way. Absolutely. I think the more you can get kids outdoors, all kids the more likely they are to want to do. I mean, I, I'm, I know there are studies, I can't think of one offhand, that have shown people that have had some outdoor experience are far more unlikely to enjoy and want to maintain the outdoors as they become adults. I, I wonder, with, with your kids, how old are your kids, by the way, Vince? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't cut off. It. Yeah, I, I, I wholeheartedly concur that getting the hook into people earlier not just from the, I mean, not so I can sell more trips outdoors. I just think it benefits people to get outdoors and, and will help affect some of these communities that currently um, are not well represented in, in what we do. Mm. How old are your children? I have three boys that are uh, one just turned 15. And then two younger ones that are seven and nine. They're both on the cusp of eight and 10. Yeah. And, and um, as a dad, how have you gone about getting them involved in the outdoors, climbing, mountaineering? Um, what, have you had any strategies or have you been like hit and hope at a golf driving range? What's been the way forwards? Well, you know, it's interesting. I, I've seen a lot of kids in some, I used to live in a lot of mountain communities and the classic thing there are the kids that they want to go do city stuff. They don't, they're, they're, they're sick of living in the ski area or whatever it is. And, and I, so I, I didn't force my kids to do anything, but they are, they come along with my wife and I on activities. We go camping a lot mm. and take them camping just to get outside. And when we do what we do, uh, we allow them to join us if they want. And that might be biking. For a while, my children enjoyed BMX biking, which I don't do, or I didn't. I did. I want to say did. Mm. And so, you know, just provided them with that opportunity. And then along with the, the skiing and climbing, we took them skiing. And it seems like kids... Generally, once they try that, they, they seem to like it. So that was one, an, e an easier one to get them interested in. And, and the climbing has been hit or miss with them. I mean, sometimes they just as soon me hook them up to a harness and like let them do these big swings as, as the actual climbing. But I think just, just, I just have had the, the, uh, the, uh, I guess.
the view of him out there, opportunity. Uh, the older one really likes to climb. The middle one likes to ride his bike. And the youngest one likes to do a combination of all these things. So that's really it. I'm, I'm sure everybody has, you know, if, if they were into horseback riding or fishing, I, I'd, I'd stoke that fire if that's what seemed to be what they were doing. Not what we do here. Uh, but but I would I'm open to to any of those things. Just kind of get them out there a bit and mm. see what see what sticks. Yeah, it's it's a hard one in as much as you you kind of want want your kids to have some of your passion, um, but uh, also you don't want to force it on top of them. You want them to find their own version of it or their own version of something. Um, and it's just a I, I just see a lot of dads in the outdoors who struggle with. Um, either reducing the time they have at their weekends to go hiking or biking, or whatever it might be, or stopping completely for a number of years um, and, um, and not managing to integrate their kids into the whole, the, the whole thing. Um, it's just, it just seems like an interesting juggling act, that's all. Yeah, it really is. I think you have to decide if, if, it, if, you're, if it's your own passion and whatever that is, it, and you want it to remain that, it may not be that you want your children going, doing that with you. It might cut away from your personal time, but if it's something that you're willing to share and make the emphasis, I think there's there's a time for each. You know, you mm-hmm. can have the time for you if you're passionate and you really want to do your part of it. And then there's a the time if, if your children or your spouse or other friend friends want to do it that you, you have the time to, to devote to their experience which is often different right from mm. a lot of these activities if you're really good at it or you're really advanced it's it's going to be at a completely different level when you're taking uh children out so uh, but yeah I, I i don't know that yeah it can be a struggle for for parents to maybe get their kids into that nowadays but uh most i've had a good opportunity to take other kids out a lot and almost all of them that come out they they have some fun when they get out there i think that's the main thing you keep it fun when you're an adult you take it all seriously and it, it matters if you you know how good your golf game was or how good your climb or how fast your bike ride was but the kids are they're they're still about this the fun of doing it and, and I think that's the important thing is to keep the fun aspect uh, available when you're introducing children to these activities that we take seriously. Mm. Even for adults as well, isn't it? I mean, if you can uh, if you can keep a smile on an adult's face as they're being pushed a bit, um, actually, they generally put some of their worries and concerns to one side, and and that positivity of the smile seems to help them up more than um, the the shaky leg or the stress or the strain. I think. Um, I think fun is very much underrated in the outdoor recreation world as for all levels of development. It's just my, certainly for me it is, and that's my personal opinion. <laughs> I, I think you're right. I think it is. So um, I've got a few questions before, before we wrap up or a few things. Um, a lot of our listeners um, may well be thinking about taking on a big peak for themselves at some point in time. And I, I know you've, prepared a whole load of people to go and do expeditions and go and do big peaks. What's, what's that preparation recipe look like to have the best possible likelihood of success when you get to your Denali or your somewhere in the Karakoram or, or wherever it may well be? Well, it's individual, obviously. Everybody has unique needs and uh, places that they already are. So and it's also individual to the particular mountain or objective they're preparing for. So I think for me, the way I go about it, when I have somebody that's interested or asks me how to prepare, it could just, it doesn't have to be a client. It could be somebody I run into that wants to know how to prepare for a mountain uh, that they want to climb. I will probably find out what, what is it about that mountain that is unique or what are the particular challenges of it. Now, a lot of them have fairly similar types of requirements and then what is it about that individual that they would where where are their skills at relative to what's needed to do that and and it may be that they lack simply 
the, the technical efficiency in the movement, particularly for more technical involved, uh, technically involved climbs, rock climbing or uh, ice climbing, things that have more of that nature. Um, for a lot of the higher mountains that are less technical, it's predominantly uh, your cardiovascular fitness and or some ability to uh, deal with altitude. And sometimes there's some mental fortitude components. And you see where that matches up with people. With with a given skill set they they have at the time, and then and then from that I generally then make recommendations on what what it is, and for a lot of people I think the, your typical the person that seems to desire to go up these larger mountains or what they what they think of as larger mountains mountaineering there there's usually some overall burden of 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 endurance and cardiovascular fitness that most people don't have the luxury of training or in their day-to-day, whatever train form of training that is due to just the, the busy lifestyle that people lead. You know, if you work a lot and you have opportunity to, to exercise, it's probably li- limited. Mm. And, and, and most people given a limited amount of time often do some form of more intense activity. So often it's the endurance that, that people are lacking. That seems to be a common thread. So the typical one is finding some way for people to try to increase their own endurance. That, that's generally a common theme for a lot of these larger mountains. They're just going to involve a, several days of you know being out for a long time. And there, there's obviously other things too. You know, there are some discomforts of being outdoors, camping. It's, it's funny. Some of the people I work with, a lot of particularly. Uh, middle-aged men when we do these trips that involve extended periods in a tent they're so tight and inflexible they have it's virtually impossible for them to sit in a tent you know what i mean the, mm. the legs crisscross like that they, they just can't do it and so their ability to rest and recover is really compromised if we're sitting around in a tent for many days and i tell them like you need to go go to a yoga class I was going to say yoga. <laughs> we're, we're, work on sitting cross-legged at home. And that that alone will make your time in the tent better and the whole thing go better. So it, it's different for everybody. But uh, generally, it's, it's, it's some level of base fitness and then whatever technical expertise, the minimum level of that might be for the particular outing. Mm. And what about altitude sickness? I know that we don't really know, have all the answers about it. But is there... Is there some answers out there about ways you can prepare yourself so it becomes less of a factor? Or yeah, maybe I think uh, you can pick better parents. <laughs> Get better but, genes. <laughs> no, I mean, there's obviously those that have a better genetic disposition to to do well at altitude, and and that's that's yeah, you have what you have, so you can't change that. Again, though. You know, uh, clearly what altitude is, it's it's a lack of getting enough oxygen on board. And the best thing you can do is to improve your ability to take on oxygen through breathing and having a good pump, pumping the blood. So the cardiovascular fitness is not going to cure everything. And some people can be very fit and still have difficult at altitude, but it generally does not hurt anybody to be in better cardiovascular fitness that are going to altitude. So that that's usually one. And the other preparation is the try the true tried and true, you know, take the time that you need to while you go up because your body will adapt. Mm. There's obviously medical interventions that some people use in the forms of some medications that can speed things along for some. And some people do utilize that there have been advances in using pre-acclimatization and hypobaric chambers that people may use at home and i think that that can help and and then obviously on the highest peaks a lot of people use supplementary oxygen to facilitate that uh, but but i think beyond that those things it's it's mostly because it is a serious deal, obviously it's, it's life threatening, and if you you don't want to mess around with it, and and uh, you're in often in places where it's difficult to to get out of the environment if you have a problem. 
And, and I think the best thing people can do is get quite fit. As my friend Mark Twight used to say, make yourself harder to kill. Uh, so, you know, if you can breathe well and you can move more efficiently, so you're not having to breathe as much for the same, same task, that's going to help right away. And then going up slowly and, and also don't make the, the highest mountain your first rodeo. You should probably go experience this somewhere, you know, in moderate doses beforehand and see what that's all like. You know, here in Colorado, it's pretty easy. We have 4,000 meter mountains that people climb on the weekends and that's moderate altitude and gives you a feel for it. Mm. You can start going up a little higher. You can go to South America, go to five and 6,000 meters. And then, then if, you know, if that seems to be your cup of tea, then move on over to, to the big, big mountains uh, that are higher up in, in Asia and see how they're, they are. That, that's at least my, my thought on all that. Mm. It's very slow. slow. <laughs> yeah, I, I did a lot of CrossFit um, quite a few years ago. Well, not that, but before I became mm-hmm. that, and um, when I moved to Johannesburg, so here in Johannesburg, I'm at about 1,800 meters above sea level. Um, oh wow! And oh. I, I came from the UK that's at about zero meters above sea level. Um, and the, that first six weeks when I was here. Um, I noticed that I couldn't lift as much, I couldn't run as fast, or if I could, I couldn't recover as fast. And um, no. just just that little difference of maybe 15, 1,500 meters um, doesn't sound like a lot, but it was it was profound in the CrossFit gym at six o'clock in the morning. Um, and, and so I can only imagine what it's like. Well, I've never been up above 7,000, so I can only imagine what it gets like when you get up that high. Yeah, it really reduces your ability to do everything, and as we as we've seen, the uh, the that that's the challenge, in my opinion. Uh, that is the, the the challenge of these high altitude peaks. You know, if you Mount Everest is in my is not the tallest mountain in the world. It, it is the highest, but, but it's not the tallest. And what makes Mount Everest quite difficult is that because of its height. There's very little oxygen to breathe up there. And, and that is a really difficult task to have your body able to do it. I think there are some people who probably just don't have the physical capabilities to uh, survive in that environment. So I think that that's to me the, the big challenge of these higher mountains it, it is the altitude. And of course, you can combine that with the, the terrain and the difficulty in overcoming the terrain to attain those those positions and you know is it i I don't think it's a terrible thing to play with there's some risk as we know there's quite a bit of it in going up high and and you know and oddly enough the risk is is often the attraction for some you know that that we have in in any adventure really but i think if you play it cautiously and take your time and you know take a you know three to five year plan to go up to these higher peaks you you'll eventually figure out whether or not it works for you or or not and how and how how it works for you as an individual going up to these high if high altitude is truly an attractive thing to do but i found you know my excursions up quite high and, and it can even be not super high just depends on how acclimatized i am for the environment that i'm going into it, it the compromise is it's physical for sure but it's also intellectual and mental like i find reduced faculties for decision making and cognitive thinking and you know like emotional capacity i can become irritable and, and then all these things are, are uh, it's an interesting uh thing that it does to us mm. we're not supposed to be up there <laughs> no we're not and it's funny that um things like uh, increased levels of stress and anxiety can actually um, reduce the body's ability to process oxygen effectively. So um, part of part of that managing it, I, I would guess, um, is that, as you said, intellectual and mental side that you, you know you're capable of being there and you feel some degree of comfort in that, in that place as opposed to some degree of this is foreign and terrifying. Um, I, I think that's definitely got something to do with it. 
Tell me, Vince. You, yeah, you, and that, that comes from oh, that on. comes from being more familiar with it, doing it more. Mm. Um, you've been at the, the cutting edge of climbing and mountaineering now for a, a quite a quite a long period of time, and you've 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 seen huge amounts of development in the sport and people doing things now that probably when you sat, when you first started climbing, you thought was nigh on impossible. I'm thinking like uh, Alex Honnold's uh, ropeless ascent of El Cap and, you know, so on and so forth. We can't go any higher. So I, I guess, what do you think is coming up next in climbing and mountaineering in terms of people pushing the boundaries? Um, is it is it harder routes on on... on High peaks? Is it uh, is it more technical? What do you, what do you think is coming towards us? Well, I think one of the things that I have in, in my time since I started climbing in the 1980s that I've seen really change is a much more higher degree of specialization within, I guess, the umbrella of climbing. And, 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 and yes, that specialization had already taken place before I started, but at least back then, it still seemed like climbing for a lot of people meant, you know, mountaineering and rock climbing and ice climbing and, and maybe even backcountry skiing or ski mountaineering. They were kind of the same group of people by and large, but some and bouldering too. Like some mm. people use bouldering to train for all this. Now it's much more specialized. And, and I think what's what's happening are people pushing the boundaries in within the specializations of, of these various types forms of climbing uh, safety has been now i think universally accepted as as a good component of most of the sub disciplines of climbing so within rock climbing particularly uh with with higher degrees of safety, we're seeing the, the levels of rock climbing go very, very high. You know, you put bolts into the side of the cliff and you know, by and large, you're you're gonna you're gonna have a safe experience and there you can focus on just utmost difficulty. Whereas in the 1970s into the 80s, some of the, the boldness or the danger involved added, I think, for a lot of people to the value of the difficulty. And it still plays a role uh, in in certain realms, but I think the the, ex, the vast explosion in popularity is with more of the safer forms of these things, and I think we're seeing just technical difficulty go up in in rock climbing, bouldering, and when you start to get into the Uh, nearing a world, just more people want to enjoy getting out to these high places. I mean, for better or for worse, Everest is very popular now, and you'll probably see that uh, go over to the other 8,000 meter peaks. But I do feel like there is room for a higher, not higher, but difficult, uh, difficult technical climbs on these high peaks that I think is not as it doesn't seem like that has grown in popularity nearly as much over this time frame as other things. I, it almost seems like in the 1980s, uh, particularly with with climbers from the Eastern Bloc countries that were really doing quite a bit uh, in that time frame into the early 90s, there, there may even be a little less what I consider truly difficult technical mountaineering going on on the higher peaks. It's, it's almost like you can get more bang for your buck by if, if you're just trying to make a splash by going to put up uh, you know, a new line or a variation to an existing line on a technical peak that's pretty well known. But there's, it seems to me, I mean, when I was still interested in climbing, I had, I had a list of all these mountains that I would love to have had the chance to climb. And most of them still, I don't even hear about people going on expeditions to try them. So they're out there, whether the, and, and you do hear the interest of people still going out, trying to push the limit of, uh, on these higher mountains going, uh, in, in, in a more difficult way. It seemed like, I think in my generation, if, if I can call it that, there was some emphasis on the, how you went to go climb the mountain was there was like, 
we wanted to go climb with less means in a simpler manner, alpine style. That was certainly what appealed to me. Try to go with with, a, with the least that I could get by with in in a short period of time. And I think that now that that's a reasonably way to climb a plot on, on more difficult, technically difficult climbs. I mean, some of the things that we consider, like even, even the climb that, that Steve, Steve House and I climbed on Nanga Parbat, which was hard for the time. I mean, we never climbed anything that, that would require five, you know, somebody that had 513 even um, rock climbing capabilities. It didn't require that, but you had to be able to climb reasonably well mm. on moderate terrain at altitude. And, and so I suspect there'll be people that are quite gifted technical climbers that, that want to apply that to higher mountains. And those opportunities are there. And, and um, that's, I, I suspect that's perhaps where the, the pointed tip of the spear, if you will, will, will head, at least in the mountain discipline. And I think with the rock, we're kind of seeing it go into the, just the extremely hard uh, single move, you know, boiling it down into boulders and on these floor climbs to just incredibly difficult, um, well rehearsed ascents that, you know, may take people years and, you know, many, many, many days of, of attempts before they succeed at them. Mm, the, uh, yeah, ha- having, having the rock face rebuilt in your garage in a, or in your shop in a, as, as a bouldering wall to rub go. And- repetitively practice yeah. rocks move <laughs> yeah that's funny you say that a good friend of mine wants to do this route this famous climb on it on el capitan called free rider that's that's what alex free soloed and uh a, a, a couple other friends of ours were, were involved in the filmmaking of that movie and provided him with a bunch of uh stills of this boulder problem that tracks a free rider and so my friend has built a boulder problem simulator in his garage to to spec with like the measured distances and about proximate size of the holds, so he can practice this move, if you will, this series of moves in his garage because he wants to try to go there and climb it first go, like get it on his first try. So he's it's interesting like that it's pretty smart and i i'm sure you'll be able to at some point like very accurately recreate any difficult move from who knows some laser printed rock climbing holds you put on the gym wall and and you can get familiar with the uh the the whatever uh crux pitch on the mountain or the or the rock face that you're you're going to do before you even leave your home that, that'll happen you just have to go do a marathon, run a marathon beforehand, so that uh, you're under enough stress when you do it to actually yeah. be able to do it under that duress. That's the that's the trick. Cool. Well, listen, Vince, thank you so much for your time. If um, if people want to come and hang out with you, um, come climbing, go clearing with you, or anything else, what's the best way of them finding you, please? Well, uh, through my business, Skyward Mountaineering, skywardmountaineering.com. Uh, pretty easy to find us there. And um, I'm pretty easy to find on uh, the social media, the uh, Facebook and the uh, Instagram. But I'm, I'm not on the Twitter, but uh, you can find me generally looking up Vince Anderson, uh, climber. There's probably a few of us, but, but I, might, I, I, might, I might not be too hard to find. Cool. Well, well, we'll we'll go and have a hunt and put some of those links below. Evan, do you have any uh, final party words, comments, or thoughts for climbers and mountaineers out there? Yeah, um, yeah I I like to tell people this frequently. Uh, life begins with fear. That moment you came out, which none of us remember. I bet that was terrifying, and that's how our life began. So do yourself a favor and go scare yourself. Fantastic. Words from the master himself. Go scare yourself. Vince Anderson, it's been a pleasure and I look forward to our next conversation. Thank you so much. Likewise, thanks, Rob. Have a great day. Cheers, mate.